Well, good morning, everyone. And welcome to Emmanuel United Church of Christ, where we have a passion for God and compassion for all. We want to start off today by saying happy birthday this week to Sandra as well as to Elaine Millward. We also want to lift up for all of our sisters and brothers from Ohio that November 2nd is National Ohio Day when the state became officially part of the country. We want to celebrate the success of last night's benefit concert for Haiti. We had a wonderful time. Carnid put on some wonderful music and Randy created some wonderful food and hospitality, made a wonderful looking fellowship hall. If you remember, we were saying that it takes $20 to send a student in Haiti to school for a whole semester. Last night, in an hour and a half, we raised $1,021 to send 51 students to Haiti. Amen. And today for our agape offering, because this is the day of the month where we take two offerings, Steve had decided that all the money raised for agape is also going to go towards the students in Haiti. So please know that the number is 1,021, but by the end of the today it will be a little bit higher with everyone here. Can we get an amen? Amen. amen. Also a reminder that we have a delicious brunch that is being cooked right now that will be available after worship. We are also selling quarts of tomato sauce for $8 per quart. All the money from the brunch and the spaghetti sauce is going to our irrigation system. And as if that's not enough, this Tuesday, Quarters for Cause, which is a local nonprofit organization, is donating the money from their event to our Shepherd's Pantry. So we will be there. We invite everyone to attend if you've never been to Quarters for a Cause. It is a great opportunity. And in our usual tradition, we are raffling off a large screen TV. So if you're able to make it, that would be wonderful. With all of those announcements being shared, we ask now that if you feel comfortable enough to silence your cell phones and all the stress and all the worries from the week before, now is the time to let that go. And as our musicians usher us into a holy space and a holy time, we are invited to sing together as one voice our mission theme song. shepherd caring for God's beloved flock. We show our thanks through generosity and giving to others. Today we give testimony that love is as strong as death and passion as fierce as the grave. We lean upon our beloved, thankful for all that God has done. Thank you. 
come to a very special part of today's service in which we have the opportunity to remember and honor our saints. And what a perfect song to introduce this moment, thinking about all the stories that have gone on before us and all the gifts that our saints have blessed us with. Traditionally, we ring a bell after each name, but there's something very different about this year. It could be with everything we've gone through. It could be how lengthy the names are and who the people are. But it just felt within my soul that instead of a bell, we're just going to allow a time of silence between each name as a way of honoring the losses that we have experienced as a family of God. Here now, the names of the saints who have gone on to be with God, the source of all goodness. Today we lift up and we remember Mary Dickey. Arthur Freer. His beloved wife, Millie Freer. Today we lift up Carolyn Guther. We lift up the life and the ministry of Reverend Lynn Joslin. Today we remember Kim Lathwell. Ben Liebenthal. Former organist and lifelong resident of Avon Park, Gloria Lockwood. Today we lift up one of our founding mothers, Betty Alweiler. Today we lift up and remember Don Rawlings. Donald Reedy. And we lift up two men of great faith and gentle hearts. Jim Sparks. and Jerry Wolford. <coughs> Gracious and Holy One, into your loving arms, we commend the saints who have gone on before. And we give thanks for the ways in which their life was a testimony to your goodness. And though our hearts miss them greatly, we give thanks for having known them. It is in your son's name we pray and we say, Amen. And now that we have honored our saints, you are invited to rise so we can sing as one voice. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus. to turn and go to our neighbors and extend to them a sign of grace and welcome.
And it is such a joy to see so many people here today. But we know that we also have so many people watching from home. So let us turn to the camera and also extend to them a sign of grace and welcome. Please be with us. And you may please face forward. Christ is our advocate, leading us to the light of righteousness, which means no matter what tragic mistakes we may have made, we can take them before Jesus and lay them at his feet. Let us now enter into our own time of silent confession. And knowing that the Lord who authors our stories is also the God who forgives our mistakes, let us join as one voice to say, The Lord listens to our hearts, forgives our sins, and shines upon us. We are surrounded by grace and not forgotten. Amen. You may be seated. Chapter 3, verses 16 through 28. Later, two women who were prostitutes came to the king and stood before him. The one woman said, Please, my lord, this woman and I live in the same house, and I gave birth while she was in the house. Then, on the third day, after I gave birth, this woman also gave birth. We were together. There was no one else with us in the house, only the two of us were in the house. Then this woman's son died in the night because she lay on him. She got up in the middle of the night and took my son from beside me while your servant slept. She laid him at her breast and laid her dead son at my breast. When I rose in the morning to nurse my son, I saw that he was dead, but when I looked at him closely in the morning, clearly it was not the son I had born. But the other woman said, no, the living son is mine, and the dead said, son is yours. The first said, no, the dead son is yours, and the living son is mine. So they argued before the king. Then King Solomon said, the one says, this is my son that is alive, and your son is dead. While the other says, not so, your son is dead, and my son is a living one. 
So King Solomon said, Bring me a sword, and they brought a sword before the king. King Solomon said, Divide the living boy in two, then give half to the one and half to the other one. But the woman, whose son was alive, said to the king, Because compassion for her son burned within her, Please, Lord, give her the living boy. Certainly do not kill him. The other said, It shall be neither mine nor yours. Divide it. Then King Solomon responded, Give the first woman the living boy. Do not kill him. She is his mother. All Israel heard of the judgment that the king had rendered, and they stood in awe of the king because they perceived that the wisdom of God was in him to execute justice. Here ends today's reading. So there are three things I'm feeling called to share before we even get to our prayer. The first, Tracy, I loved when you went angels all around. I would love to see everyone just do that right now. Angels all around. Second, we want to acknowledge that this is a scary story and that there are actually quite a few clergy around the country who are choosing not to preach on this because as we continue to grow in our faith, we continue to realize that stories that deal with issues of children and motherhood and death and violence are not easy to hear. And I want you to know that every time we teach or preach on one of these stories, especially because of Bible study, we are always so aware of what we're hearing and what is actually being said. The third thing is today you're gonna to hear two sermons. You're going to hear from me first, and then after that, we are going to hear from our moderator, Diane. So you'll be able to hear about wisdom being presented by two different people, two different ways, two different themes. Can we get an amen? amen. So it's kind of like the double feature when you were growing up and going to the drive-in. Two sermons today. So let's start off with a word of prayer. Gracious and Holy One, you have brought us into this sacred space, and there are indeed angels all around. Thank you for guiding us, and thank you for filling us with your compassion for one another. It is in Christ's name we pray and we say, Amen. So, 52 years old. I am 52 years old and it boggles my mind that I'm still figuring things out because in my mind I should know it all by now. <laughs> so this week there were some things I learned. One, thanks to my mentor from Odessa, I learned that successful people will purposely schedule things to do during the week and if they're not able to do it, they will find a way to adjust their schedule accordingly without feeling like they are a failure or they have made a big mistake. Second thing I've learned is that when you come across a delicate topic and you're not really sure what to do, the wisest thing is to turn to someone you admire and to seek their guidance. The third thing is that when you're dealing with a family member who is angry because of grief, sometimes the best thing you can do is shut your mouth and let your family member work through their grief on their own. Wisdom, knowing when to speak, when to be still, when to move ahead, when to let go, when to let something have one more glorious try, all involves wisdom. Wisdom is the ability to think beyond just your head, and wisdom is the ability to think beyond 
facts and data, and wisdom often involves using your heart and your instinct and the lessons that have been learned by your ancestors and the people who have come before. Biblically speaking, wisdom is also following the voice of the Holy Spirit. And if you remember in the book of Proverbs, wisdom is referred to as a woman who opens up her house and was there with God before the world was created. Wisdom is the very thing that King Solomon sought in chapter 3 of today's reading. Solomon has the opportunity to step into the servant role of being the third king of Israel. And God appears to Solomon and says, ask for anything you want. And Solomon says, God, you have shown such great love to my father, David. You have made me your new servant, and I don't have the sense that's been given to a goose. So in order for me to serve your people who are your most prized possession, what I am asking is that you give me the wisdom to rule with justice and to serve with compassion. I have never realized what this story was really about until this week. Because I thought wisdom was intelligence. And I never realized that the whole reason he's seeking wisdom is so he can do justice, <coughs> kindness, and humility. And how amazing that King Solomon could have asked for anything. He could have asked for a long life. He could have asked for riches. But instead, what Solomon asks is, Give me the tools needed to be a faithful servant leader to your chosen beloved people. And what's so fascinating when you read today's story is what is the very first case that Solomon addresses? What is the very first public act that Solomon performs after asking for wisdom? Is it having two political leaders like Chris and DeSantis coming before him? No. Is Solomon's first act dealing with giant corporations like Disney and... Name another second generation corporation. Twitter. Universal, GM. No. Is Solomon called to use his wisdom to hang out with the popular people of Hollywood like Spielberg and Tyler Perry? The answer is no. Solomon's very first public act after asking for the gift of wisdom involves two citizens who come before him. And not just two citizens, but two unmarried women who would have been seen as the most powerless of their day and not just two unmarried women, but two women who make their living as prostitutes. And the case doesn't just involve these two unmarried women who would have been seen the lowest of the low. It involves their children, one of which is dead. We may be so used to hearing this story that we have actually become numb to what is going on. And I know that I have been numb. And then this week all the pieces came together. King Solomon, the most powerful man in all the land, asked for the wisdom to serve God's people. And the first act involves three humans who would have been seen as the lowest of the low of the low. And here's the thing that I think is so fascinating and it seemed like no other theologian touched upon. Solomon's first act with this wisdom focuses on the most natural, necessary part of human life, which is motherhood and childbirth. But here's the thing. As many people here today know, the topics of motherhood and childhood 
are perhaps also some of the most painful and heartbreaking experiences there are. And when you think about it, motherhood is probably the most universal topic on this planet because regardless if you're a man or a woman, we all have different emotional reactions and memories and experiences of what it means when we use the word mom or mother. We know that childbirth is perhaps the most natural thing in the world. But we also know that childbirth is not easy. With childbirth, there are too many variables, too many things that can go wrong. Childbirth can bring forth life, but it can also bring about pain and loss and tough choices that have to be made. The reality and the complexity and the emotions of childbirth are perhaps the most female-centric thing that is possible. And that female-centric thing is the very thing that Solomon is called upon to focus on after his gift of wisdom. Are you noticing that King Solomon, the most powerful person in the entire land, is not focusing his gift of wisdom on which politician to endorse, or not which corporation to give the biggest tax break to, or not what celebrity does he want to be focused with. King Solomon's very first act as a public servant is to use his wisdom in regards to motherhood and a vulnerable child and two women who earn their living by being sex workers. And I also hope that everyone notices not once does King Solomon judge them or pass a moralistic sense of superiority. He sees them for who they are without judgment or criticism. Today's reading in many ways ends up becoming an insight into who is God? And how does God want God's servants to be? And just who is it that God actually cares about? This truly is a least of these narrative in which we discover that God does indeed care about us and that God does care about the very things we go through, even the most natural, even the most mundane, even the most heartbreaking, and that God does care about every aspect of our life. You see, this story is not about a faraway God who doesn't have time for people who aren't known or popular or have names. This isn't a story about a God who only cares about the powerful and the righteous. Today's story shows us how God is right here how God has time for those who society refuses to acknowledge, that God has time for the weak and those who are just trying their hardest to make it through another day. God's wisdom is that we are all God's children, and so therefore we all deserve to be seen, heard, and cared about. God wisdom reminds us that the most ordinary and most universally shared experience, life and death, loss and grief, really does matter to our Creator. And for that, I believe we can say, Amen. So that is part one of our double feature. I'd like to now pass the mic on to Diane, our moderator, who's also going to share some thoughts and reflections. Thank you, uh, Pastor George. And and uh, I'm really hoping my goal is that this is not a sermon, um, but a sharing of some information and, uh, and really touching upon how 
God works in such incredibly mysterious ways. Uh, your council, um, which is made up of seven individuals who love God, love this church, and will work tirelessly to ensure that Emmanuel continues on. And uh, we've been working a lot of hours lately. Here we are in the fourth quarter of the year. Um, I know that you get tired of us talking about money and bringing up our shortfalls or our deficit. And as we sat and reviewed what we've done in the past, our natural tendency was to go exactly in that same direction. We've had, quote, meet the budget campaigns for years, uh, sometimes pretty successful, sometimes less successful. And we've talked about money in lots of different ways. And we were really kind of at an imp uh, impasse. And we were falling into old patterns and old ways. And lo and behold, wise words from our conference settled in our email boxes this week. And as I really took time, which is unusual for me, to read everything that was in the email, um, it was, wow, this is so speaking to us at Emmanuel. And it talked about language, it talked about attitude, and it talked about approaches to the financial well-being of your church and your congregation. And it really, I, I will tell you, they have to have been powerful, word, powerful words because they even turned Tracy Miller around. <laughs> and we, we sat and we talked about our tendency as a council has been to talk with urgency. And when people put that in front of you, and I, and I speak of an urgent nature, it is a stressful situation. And it passes stress from us on to you as a congregation, and on the pastor, and it isn't healthy for anyone. And quite honestly, it doesn't really get us very far. And so, you know, whether it was part of the wisdom of Solomon in Bible study on Tuesday, this email that came from John Vernigan at conference that spoke about urgency versus agency. Um, we sat and had the most wonderful meeting about finances and talking with Emmanuel. Now, we didn't cure the deficit. We didn't defeat the deficit. But we did come up with a couple of ideas that we think will help everyone understand some things. We've been very upfront over the last number of months about the deficit that we're in. And so we decided we are not trying to meet the budget. Let's throw that out of the out of our way and put that away. Because our budget is something different. Everyone I think understands the deficit that we're carrying is the shortfall that we have had accumulated from the last couple of years. And so it looks like a very large number. It's not where we are just from today, but it is an accumulation of shortfall that we have had in a gap between the resources that Emmanuel has and our vision of who Emmanuel is and the ministries that Emmanuel is involved in. So we are going to do a defeat, beat the deficit campaign because we do need a campaign and we do have a deficit. And so this is a high goal. This not, I mean, this brings us to zero. This brings us to even Stephen and not in the hole. We're going to have a, an AC check next week after fellowship or during fellowship 
And we'll be talking uh, a lot more about this, about the state of Emmanuel's campus and what we're facing as, um, and financially with Emmanuel and where we are from a ministry standpoint. And uh, we will be talking about our annual meeting, which is coming up on November 20th, the Sunday before Thanksgiving. You'll be receiving a packet in the next week or so that will have an agenda and our financials in it for your review. And uh, in, in that, we, are, um, we, have, we have a proposed budget for 2023 that doesn't look a whole lot different than 2022 because what we have found is our expenditures are actually, I mean, we have them almost right on the money. And so we know that that faces some, some challenges again and some opportunities. So we are going to be talking about uh, an intent to give campaign. You're going to be hearing more about that in the future and um, in how we can use that to close the gap between the resources that we have for Emmanuel and the ministries that we are involved in. Because when we have a gap, between our resources and our vision and our ministries, then we have a decision that we have to make. Because we cannot always continue on with the ministries that we have if we aren't able to have the resources to support them. So we will be looking as a council and talking with you about the resources and sources that we are looking to utilize and that you are providing us and what that allows us to do in the ministries of Emmanuel. Um, I would not say that um, your council is made up of Solomons by any means, but we have seven people who when we put our minds and our hearts together in a room, come up with some pretty darn good stuff. And we really take really close and careful care of Emmanuel. We have, coming up, I'm going to take this since we talked about politics, we have an open chair um, in 2023. And that chair is a, a congregant, a member at large. What that means is you come to the table with an opinion and you aren't afraid to voice it. You don't have to chair a committee. You don't have to run anything. You don't have to do anything other than share your opinion as a member of the congregation as to what we are doing. So if that is something that you would be interested in doing, um, we are looking for someone who is willing to share an opinion at the table of your council. So we will have a seat, so we're looking. Uh, so if that's something you're interested in, let me know. So uh, I, I don't want to go on really any, any longer. I think our point um, is there and our, our gap that we're looking at um, between our resources and our ministries are something that we will continue to work on, to talk about, and to uh, work towards eliminating uh, so that we can continue. Um, Emmanuel is kind of the church around the committed community that is known to show up. When there's something happening in the world, in Highlands County, in Florida, in Sebring, in Lake Placid, and Avon Park, um, we are the one church. We are the one church, and many times the only church that shows up and stands up for justice and kindness and walking humbly with your God. So our job and our work and our goal is to make sure that we don't have a gap between our resources and our ministries 
so that Emmanuel continues to show up. Thank you. So we just had a double feature that covered all the topics of humanity. Life, death, sex, money. Perhaps the one thing we didn't talk about is food, but after service, we're gonna have a delicious brunch. I had to kind of chuckle. I love the defeat, the deficit, especially because I think of David defeating Goliath. I think about how Jesus defeats death after the cross. But then I had to kind of chuckle when Diane said the word be, because I was thinking about, I wonder if we were to offer people boxing gloves, Tracy, and said for a certain amount of money, you could beat the pastor. <laughs> I'm in. I, you're in, I know it, I know it. If there's one person whose nerves I work all the time, it's Tracy, and thank God, we have this relationship where we can laugh about it. Let us now enter into our time of prayers for the people. Gracious and Holy One, we give thanks that there is no topic we can't discuss within your presence. And we give thanks for the gift of honesty and humility and the awareness that if we are in this covenantal relationship with you, what does it look like? We give thanks for the faces of people who are returning and the faces of those we have not seen in a long time or seen before. We are mindful of our sisters and brothers in the Philippines who have lost their lives due to the major storm. We are mindful of those in Tulsa who have lost their lives. We lift up those in Miami who are not able to live in their condos at this moment. We lift up Paul Pelosi and the awareness that our political culture has come to the point where people literally are not safe. Holy One, I ask that we pray for my family, for my cousin Johnny who died unexpectedly last week. We lift up all the saints who have gone on before, and we continue to pray for our sisters and brothers in Haiti. We give thanks for the opportunity to gather yesterday with people from all over the Caribbean and throughout the community to break bread and raise money and to sing songs. And we give thanks for the gifts that Carnid has brought upon us. We give thanks in advance for the brunch we are about to enjoy, for quarters for a cause, and we especially lift up our sister and brother Mel and Maureen as they continue to deal with health-related issues that so many of us face. It is in your son's name we pray and we say, Amen. Should I feel discouraged? And why should the shadows come? And why should my heart belong? Thank you. 
tender word I hear and resting in his God goodness I lose my doubts doubts and fear and go by the path he leadeth students of Haiti that need our help. Thank you. Oh, my. 
we are indeed standing on holy ground. And I feel like I misspoke earlier. I don't think we heard two sermons today. I think we heard four. Carneed, your wonderful testimony through song, and Judy and Diane, that was just 
the perfect example of you don't have to know the words to know what's being said. Thank you for sharing your gifts with us. The wonderful thing about today is that even though our time worshiping in here is coming to an end, our worship is still going to continue in the fellowship hall. Not only do we have the opportunity to share in a delicious brunch that is being cooked at this moment, we also have a very special prayer shawl that we are inviting people to anoint and bless for a very special person. So sometime after our meal, you will be invited to come forward and to participate in that blessing. We want to remind everyone that we have quarters for a cause this Tuesday at 7. And November 11th, we are unfolding our newest ministry, which is Movie Night. And we will be showing West Side Story, the newest version, completely for free in our fellowship hall. And there will be treats and goodies. And this is going to be something we're going to be doing on a regular basis as a wonderful ministry for people who on a Friday night want to do something, but they don't want to spend $100 going to the movie theater to do so. With that being said, you are all invited to stand for the benediction. And we ask that you extend your hands out so you bless us as we bless you. As we prepare to leave this holy space and to leave this holy time, may we step out into God's beautiful creation, knowing that we are all God's prized possessions. And with that knowledge, we are empowered with the wisdom to do justice, to love being kind, and to humbly walk with our Creator. May you go in grace and love and harmony. Amen. Thank you.